Here's a guy makes a lot of people smile whenever they're around him. Man, we go way back, Terry Nelson. I can't believe you got that, uh, that, that, that gray in the beard, man. I remember you were some strapping cat coming out of California and showing up with Blunt and Van Exel and, you know, that whole bunch and Herb Jones. And, boy, it's hard to believe it's been that long ago, isn't it? I feel it in my knees, so it's not that hard to believe, brother. <laughs> knees. <laughs> it's been, what, 31 years, 32 years now. And you guys had, what was it, the 30th reunion of that team a, a, a year or two ago, something like that? You all got back together here in town. Is that right? It was actually during homecoming. It was in October. So we had our 30-year. They brought back for um, the Final Four team and the Elite Eight team. So the 91-92 team, the 92-93 team, uh, Wes Miller one in the university brought us all back in, flew in everybody and their families, including Coach Huggins, uh, and had a great time. Um, all right, look, the, the story has grown through the years. You know, the legend of, of you come in, uh, great teams, and now here comes a cross-town shootout, and oh you guarantee this is going to be a tail kick. And walk, walk us through that story of what really happened when, when you went on the record and made that prediction. How did that all happen? So I was – we had just – I think we just beat UAB or something. So, and all the other teammates used to run out the back door because they didn't want anybody to see all the women that they had left tickets for. So they used, <laughs> they used to always send me, because I had the mouthpiece, they would send me in front of the camera to do all the interviews. And so I was walking out the back, uh, just coming from the media session, and Bill Cook got me in the hallway. And he was like, uh, so, he interviewed me about the previous game. And he said, so, what do you think about the Crosstown shootout? And I'm like, look, man, seriously? where I'm from, I'm from Long Beach, California, where I'm from, Crosstown Shootout, a rival gang member's going at it. I said, blow them out. They don't have a chance. Like, because we played them all summer. We They came to our gym. We went to their gym. I didn't think anything of it. I was just, you know, tongue in cheek. I've been known to pop off a little bit. So uh, I get back first thing in the morning. I had no idea that, you know, we had a week break, just like we have now. So I didn't know the buildup for it because I didn't know anything about it. So first thing in the morning, it's like seven in the morning, uh, Q102 calls me, and they're like, hey, Terry, hey, I want to talk to you about the Crosstown shootout. What? I hear you say Jayla doesn't have a chance. And I'm like, yeah, they don't have a chance. You know, we should blow them out by 20. You know, Crosstown shootout. I'm, this gang member was going at I'm I'm talking about this. Hang up the phone. Because there was no two-way calling in the dorms back in 1991. Some dorm phones. Hang up the phone, 700 WLW. Somebody called me. Hang up the phone, the whiz. It was seven in a row. And they were just waiting to get, I don't know how they got my number, but they were calling back to back to back. And I'm sitting in the bed like, I could do this all day. Man, this is this is, this is something else. Phone Again, I pick up the phone. I'm like, hello, get your ass in my office. I'm like, what? Hugs? He goes. <laughs> so I'm throwing on clothes. I walk over to the office and Betsy Maidens, who's our uh, secretary at the time, she's laughing so hard. She couldn't even talk to me. She's just pointing in the back, like, just, just go to his office, go to his office. So I go to his office. His office is either open or the door is closed, but he had a door stopper in it this time. And so I walk in there and he's got a newspaper up. And so I'm like, you want to see me? He goes, sit your ass down and be quiet. I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting there and five minutes go by and he's like flipping the newspaper and going through it. And he kept going. And I'm like, look at, and I look in the front page of the paper. At the top section, it says, Nelson predicts blowout, Xavier doesn't have a chance. And I'm like, oh, and he puts his newspaper down and he's got glasses on. Now, anybody knows the whole story he used to have, before he got LASIK surgery, he used to wear contacts. And he'd be up all night, you know, having cold ones, shutting down some establishment and then talking basketball, going back, watching video, you know, till five, six in the morning. And then when he comes in, his eyes are too irritated to put contacts on. So he wears his, at that point, you got to have your best practice. You got to be on P's and Q's because he's a type A and he is ready to be set off like a linchpin. How does somebody who averaged three points and two rebounds have the audacity to think that he's going to make a difference in this game? Why would you pop off like that and give them billboard material? I said, coach, I had no idea I'm being recorded. He goes, are you that stupid? You can't be that dumb. No, 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 no. He said, I'll see you at practice today. So we walk into practice and they have all of these tripods, 5, 12, 19, uh, 
nine star 64 they're all in there and they're all in their stations and so everybody's walking around hugs and i happen to walk in at the same time coming from two different places and we walk by nick van exel at the same time and ken brew was asking nick van exel what do you think about terry's uh quote that you know xavier doesn't have a chance you know you guys should blow him out by 20 and nick goes yeah i agree because their big men are soft and hugs hears it he just goes crazy he goes i said everybody get the f out he kicked the media out get out of here get out so everybody gets out so we start practice all by running 20 suicides and after about 10 of them nick said man you paranoid you know we're gonna kick their butt he goes i'm paranoid i'm paranoid get the f out of here so he kicks nick out of practice now t i don't know if you've ever seen or heard of anybody get kicked out of practice but when you get kicked out of practice you're supposed to go to the locker room yep sit there with your tail between your legs uh you know coach steve moeller would come in there and talk to you bring you back out and you're supposed to be all nice and humble ready to be coached he goes into the locker room steve moeller does comes back out he goes i don't know where he is and and Huzz goes well if you don't find him you better find another job so he, he was looking for him comes back five minutes later nick's got his jersey on backwards eating a hot dog and we're all like trying not to laugh we're covering our mouths we're laughing hard and Hugs is sitting there and puts his practice schedule under his arm. And he's just, he's like, what the hell are you doing? He says, Hugs, I don't play that. You kick me out. I ain't sticking around. He said, you know, you paranoid. He goes, okay. So I'm paranoid, huh? Five minutes into practice, Corey twists his ankle, had to be carted off. He goes, and you think their big man are soft? Look at our 6'10 stud being carted off like a slab of meat. <laughs> at that point, he just says, coach yourself. So for the first hour of practice, Anthony Buford grabbed the practice schedule, said, come on, man, let's go. So every drill we're doing, we're clapping it up. We're like, yeah, let's go. Like we're making them mad because we're hitting shots and we're having lots of energy. And then so he goes, okay. So the next so the game comes and we start out, we, we blitz them bad. You know, they're trying to press us. We throwing over the press. We're getting dunks. And we end up beating them on the road in their place by 18. And after we did the handshake line, he walks out. We're you know, we're walking to the locker room. He puts his arm around me. He goes, All right, why don't you retire one and oh as a prophet? <laughs> <And now. laughs> that is awesome. That is a great story. That is yeah, and I was around uh back when I was doing the games when all you guys were there. I, I was witness to many, many times where either individuals or uh, the team collectively was thrown out, sent back to the locker room, and, and sooner or later, everybody would be back out there. I don't know if you saw any of, probably didn't. We had hugs on the show last week uh, for about an hour. And, um, you know, I mean, what you guys had going on there was, you know, look, I, I know the national championship stuff and playing in the finals back in the early 60s and all that kind of thing. But, man, those were two really yeah. special, special teams with a lot of great characters who had a lot of great character and toughness about them. We come from different backgrounds, and and we were last chance students. You know, the, the documentary Last Chance yeah. You, we were at where – bunch of JUCO guys, a bunch of guys that transferred. Anthony Buford came with Bob Huggins. Herb Jones was a junior college player of the year, uh, national junior college player of the year. Corey Blunt was a national junior college player of the year. Corey, Eric, and I came from California. We were the three best players in California, and none of the California, the UC schools, univer you know, UCLA, USC, they, don't, they didn't take JUCO players. And so we were just looking to play together. And so we picked Cincinnati. So we came together and then they, we brought Nick Van Exel in. And Nick Van Exel came in the day that we got there. One of the funniest things I've ever seen. He was coming with his cousin and he had a hatchback. And I'm like, there he is. So we're standing all outside of Daniel's hall, waiting on him. Like all the teammates are sitting together. And he pulls up in a hatchback, opens the hatchback, and it's just littered with clothes. I mean, it's no, it's no hangers, it's no bags, it's no suitcases. It's just clothes in the back. And he, we're grabbing the clothes. We're, we're putting them in trash bags and grabbing our arms. And he has this television that he's bringing into the dorms. And it's still got a hanger in it with aluminum foil on the tips of it. For the, <laughs> for the, I mean, meager, meager beginnings. But we instantly hit it off. We instantly had chemistry. And because we could not go anywhere, we were literally the last chance university for us. Yeah just as hard as he wanted he can say whatever he wanted he can do whatever he wanted and we could not leave if we wanted to play and that just turned us into 
you know, the men that we wanted to be because we were all 22 and 23 years old, most of it. So we had been around the horn and now he's telling us that, you know, wherever we go, he's creating this mentality. Like the fans are going to get you, you know, like we're playing Miami University. And right before we're about to do Miami University, he goes, it's halftime. He goes, man, you're going to let guys with circle driveways and Mercedes and, and BMWs kick your <laughs> like this, and you don't, you guys don't even have cars, and they over here kicking your butt. You gonna let them do that? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. To up. You know, I'm curious. I asked Hugs this, and Terry, now in, in in your role as the the analyst on the um, the games on the radio alongside Dan Horde, um, I asked Hugs, "Are kids different today?" You just explained your journey and the other guys who came along with you, junior college, whatever it might be. But I guess I'm, I'm speaking more specifically now about high school kids. And I asked Hugs, uh, you know, do kids still really want to be coached and coached hard, really hard? I asked Wes Miller this two days ago when we had him on the program. He says he thinks they do. You know, I got kids in high school, daughter in college, a lot of the ones I'm around, and we're in those circular driveways, so maybe, you know, it is what it is. But how many kids out there, or do you think the kid today wants to be coached, can be coached, is okay with being coached, the way Hugs coached you? Depends on the guy that you bring in and the background that they come from. You know, some households, they're just used to a mother or a father yelling and screaming. So when you got a coach that yells and screams, it doesn't bother them whatsoever. They can take it. But if you got the modern day uh, son who is about self-esteem and, uh, you know, the parents lifting them up and they're bouncing around from AAU team to AAU team and high school team to high school team because they want a certain situation uh, for their child, then they may not be ready to be coached like that. Now, Wes Miller coaches hard, but he doesn't have to curse at them. I mean, you can coach hard. Uh, hard is hard coaching has become synonymous with, you know, cursing the kid out, demeaning him, doing all that stuff. No, that kind of stuff is uh, it's not it. Not with the portal. Not in this day and age. You cannot do that because they would just bounce around. They would just leave you, and don't even wait till the end of the season. They would just shut out. So you won't last as a college coach with that kind of demeaning and that kind of tearing down, especially if they don't trust you, if they don't think that you are doing it for the best interest, if they only see it as you need to win to keep your job, then they'll leave. But if you've established rapport, if you're constantly on the phone with, with your guys and doing things and your team bonding and they know where your heart is, then they'll take you giving them some stiff and tough criticism that can change their behavior because discipline is just training to elicit a certain pattern of response or behavior. So discipline doesn't always have to be, you know, some verbal lashing that just strips you of your humanity. Discipline or hard coaching can be anything that changes your behavior. And yes, you can still do that. All right, let's talk about the shootout tomorrow. Um, you've seen every second of every game you see has played so far this season. Before we get into some of the shortcomings, tell me how you see, what are the strengths through nine games of this UC team? The strength is the spacing and their ability to create for each other. You know, they got three-point shooting and the way the offense is structured, it's constant movement. So it's not one guy holding the ball and everybody else standing. Now, the Julius is going to be the creator in the offense because coach wants him to be able to create and get other guys shots. But that ball goes from right to left. The bigs move off the block. Nobody is standing on the block. So the free-flowing offense allows this team to score, you know, nearly 80 points per game, which is up from you know, previous eras where we couldn't, you know, sometimes we didn't even reach 80. So these guys, the offense is there. What we, uh, another one of our strengths is the ability to come from large deficits because of the free-flowing offense and the fact that we can get stops. Defensively, the problem that uh, I think Cincinnati will come up against is rim protection. You know, they don't have the big 6'10 shot blockers. They don't have the seven-foot shot blockers like they had in the past. Guys that can erase some of the mistakes of, you know, guys going for steals on the block and don't get it. And all of a sudden, out of the weak side, somebody comes and just mats it off the glass. So they have to do it with length. They have to do it with, you know, fighting through screens and closing out. So they're... Initial defense has been much better over the couple weeks, 
And it's really been elite to watch them shut down three-point shooting teams because how they fight through screens. So that's one of their strengths is that they can really scramble defensively and find a way. It's just that when that ball gets down low, if they stay out of foul trouble by playing solid, defense is one of their, their, their core strengths. All right, weaknesses. You talked about not having the big man who can uh, you know erase mistakes. Uh, somebody comes into the lane, shot blocker, intimidation kind of guy, all those kinds of things. Um, Xavier does have a couple of big guys that can play. Uh, there's yes. no debate about that. And Fremantle likes banging around. Um, what do you see as, as a couple of the, the, the determining factors between winning and losing in the game tomorrow? Being able to control the paint, um, giving them one shot, you know, making it tough as – uh, defenders in the post because they're going to play big. They're going to post. They're going to post their guards. Um, they're going to post their bigs, and they're going to try to win the game by chipping away. Um, as Bill's football, they're going to try to win the game by running the ball and making you, you know, load the box. Same thing. So, you know, same thing with basketball. They're going to post their guards. They're going to post their bigs. They're going to play pick and roll to where the roll guy is, uh, you know, either posting on a mismatch or the kickouts. So if we can defend the post, if we can push guys off the block, make them shoot uncomfortable shots. Like if a guy likes to shoot from, you know, eight feet away, top the, the middle of the circle over his left shoulder, a jump hook, you want to push him off to about 10, 12 feet and take away the jump hook and make him shoot a turnaround jump shot. Seems sounds simple, but if you shoot a turnaround jump shot, it pulls you out of rebound, rebound position, easier to box out. He'll miss the shot, take his vision away, and they'll think that they just had a bad shooting night. And they don't realize that you've taken away their number one option. And most post guys don't really have a counter that they that they go to. So they're either dunkers or they're jump hook guys. So if you can push them off the block, beat them down the floor, because Xavier does a lot of rim runs with Fremantle and Nunji. They run the floor and they seal you at the free throw line. They grab you and they just sort of ride that to the post and they get early transition offense. So if you can eliminate that, eliminate the post touches where they're just catching and scoring uncontested they got a real chance of winning this game all right well uh you know hey look you're there for each and every game terry it's it's such a pleasure i can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us uh this week love to have you back on the program check in from time to time on what's happening with uc and it's great to see you as always you know what i was wanted to, to say something you said something about before this uh my segment you said that every kid should have two years in the military yeah yes you know, in North Korea, they make you have seven years. Well, I, I know, but I, I don't want to be North Korea. But I, but I'm but you and I are on the same page, you know. And I, I'm curious, Terry. Uh, you know, we talked about this with Hugs last week. A lot of people don't want to talk about this topic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you you're never a guy to shy away from it. I mean, I went back and started digging up because Hugs, in many cases, not all cases, it's unfair to say all cases, but in some cases or a number of cases, he becomes like a father to a lot of the players that he brings in there and recruits, not only why he has them there as a player and as a coach, but through the rest of their lives. And, you know, I went in and, and started digging into some statistics about, you know, uh, African-American kids that are born in this country. 67% of them are being born into a single parent household. In the inner city, that number is up over 80%. And I asked him, you know, sort of the challenge of not only being a coach, but a dad, and I think the military, and it's the only reason I say that, and I think it would be good for a white kid in the suburbs whose mom and dad are together uh, to bring those people together. Because where's a guy like you from Long Beach and a guy like me from Cincinnati, uh, unless we're both basketball players, where are we ever going to come together to be a team, right? And the military is the team. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it forces you to, to – to have a discipline and a routine. There's so much power in routine. And when you come out of disenfranchised situations where you don't have a father in the household, I didn't have a father in the household, and you kind of go out and you're doing stuff. So you, you, if you're involved in sports, sports gives you that sense of camaraderie. And I've met, and I have some of my best friends come from all these different backgrounds that you talked about in sports. Well, in military, there's a set time you get up, there's unexpected times you get up, there's training, there's different things to 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 uh, work on response times, all that stuff that a person would need 
to go into college. Think about how many people go to college out of high school and then leave college, flunk out or don't even finish because they really don't know what they want to do. So they end up wasting money, getting loans and doing different things because they don't know what they want to do. Two years in the military, I kind of like your uh, where you're going with that. It gives them a sense of focus. They realize I don't really like the military. <laughs> I want to do yeah. this. Then yeah. yeah. Okay. Life. That's right. That's right. Well, Terry, you're, you're one of the all time greats, man. And, uh, and good luck tomorrow on the broadcast. Have fun down there. You're not making any predictions on this one, are you? Sir, nope, you ain't getting me in trouble. No, uh, <laughs> I, only, I only want the predictions on the games that I can out, have an outcome on. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Terry, great seeing you, man. Thanks for the time today. Yep. Terry Nelson, how great is that, dude? Great storyteller. I mean, it's such somebody... an articulate kid. I mean, he was the second he walked in UC. I was here when he walked in for his first practice. He just, he, he's got that it thing. You know what I mean?